So here we are finishing our series. If you've just joined us, we're at the last portion of Philippians. And uh, you're in luck, though, because I've grabbed a few verses from last week. And I just want us to look at uh, these last couple of verses to kind of get a a good transition, get a good jump on what we're going to talk about this week. So uh, Paul says, Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude... And if anything, in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So three things that I want to talk about in this passage from last week. Number one, it says, as many as are perfect. How many of you would say that you are perfect in Christ? Well, if we took the in Christ off, because it doesn't happen to appear in this passage, then how many of you would would say that you are perfect When we ask that question, we immediately survey our recent behavior and we say, hey, no way, right? Because I'm not perfectly behaved. My track record is tarnished. I've done thousands, millions, billions of sins in my life. So how is it that Paul could address us as perfect? Well, remember that he did say, last week we saw him say, not that I have attained it yet, not that I have been made perfect yet, Well, what he was talking about there was his body. Do you remember that? That he was talking about not having a resurrection body yet. But spiritually speaking, we are perfect. The blood of Jesus Christ has made you perfectly cleansed. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has made you perfectly righteous. And so even though this isn't that popular to talk about in church... It's hard to find a sermon, isn't it? It's hard to find a church, a sermon, a teacher. We get emails all the time. Tell me, I live in Maine. I live in Montana. I live in Florida. I live in California. Where can I go where someone will teach me my identity in Jesus Christ? And it's very hard to find, at least in the way that we're talking about. Because what we're talking about is that there is a finished work that has happened inside of you already. Yes, you anticipate a new body. You anticipate the glorious return of Jesus Christ when he will give you a new resurrection body to match who you are. But the good news is that right now, you are who you are. Right now, you have a new spirit, and you have the Holy Spirit living in you. And he doesn't live in dirty places. And so God cleaned house, and he moved in, and he made you a new creation, the new self, united with Christ, one spirit with him. And then Paul says, let us therefore. Now, if I were only going to say, please, guys, you got to have this attitude. Let me tell you about this incredible, lofty attitude. Now, you better have it. you got to have it, right? And in church service after church service, maybe growing up, we've heard about these attitudes we're supposed to have and these actions we're supposed to take. Attitude, action, attitude, action. If that's all that is preached then it is no different than Mormonism. It is no different than Islam. It is no different than any religion in the world that has a code of conduct. But what is different here is that he tells us at the beginning, he says, you are perfect in Jesus Christ. You have been made perfect forever. You have a new nature and a new heart and a new spirit. You have completeness in Christ Let us therefore, because of that, let us therefore have this attitude. And so when we fail to to see the identity that we have in Christ, and when we preach attitude only, we have legalism. When we only teach identity and we don't teach any attitude or any action, then we have passivity. We don't want legalism and we don't want passivity. What we want is the gospel. And the gospel says, this is who you are, therefore walk like who you are. Let us have this attitude, and if anything, you have a different attitude in anything, well, what does he say? God will reveal that to you. Now, I love that because it puts the onus on God. It puts the weight on God. It's not about us and our ability to examine ourselves. Paul was so bold in telling his audience. He picks up the pen and he writes a letter and he says some things that could be offensive to them. But he says, it does not matter to me. I don't care that any of you examine me. 
He says, it means very little to me that any of you examine me. And then he says, I do not even examine myself. And then he says, the one who examines me is the Lord. And so that's not an excuse for him to go off into sinful behavior or something. The point is, how much, how far does our introspection get us anyway? I know so many Christians, I was one of them, we can find ourselves living in life going like this. We basically walk through life, did I sin, did I sin, did I just sin, did I just sin, did I just sin? And we're examining ourselves, trying to figure out if we just sinned, trying to figure out if we just ruined it, trying to figure out how to get back in of what we just got back out of. And we're trying to analyze in order to diagnose and fix. And what that presumes is that we would have a correct analysis, we would have a correct diagnosis, and then that we could actually fix it. And so I was uh, uh, peeking in on a movie yesterday. I was flipping through the channels, and I saw this movie. It was called The, the, uh, the Invention of Lying. Have you heard about this movie, The Invention of Lying? The theory behind the movie is, is that the whole world hasn't figured out how to lie yet. Right? And so this one guy, ta-da, the light bulb goes off, and he figures out how to tell the world's first lie. Right? And so what he does after playing around with his ability to lie, what he does then is essentially invent a religion. At one point, he invents a religion by making up a story about what's going to happen to people after they die. And then as soon as he makes up a god who is a judge of behavior, guess what? He's got reporters at his doorstep. He's got thousands of people on his front lawn, and they want to know what's okay and what's not okay. And he tells them, well, it's three strikes and you're out. That's his theology. <laughs> three strikes. And so then they, of course, what do they want to know? Well, what's a strike? What counts as a strike? Is this a strike? If I have a hairdo that God doesn't like, is that a strike? What's a strike? What's not a strike? And so he starts to have to answer hundreds and hundreds of questions of what's right and what's wrong, what counts, what doesn't count. And when we get into this self-analysis, this morbid introspection, this paralysis of analysis, then we're assuming that we know what's right and we know what's wrong and we can diagnose ourselves and then we can fix ourselves to get God to like us again. And all of that is just blown to smithereens by this statement, wait a minute, let God reveal stuff to you. Let the God of the universe, who is more gracious and more loving and more kind than we could ever be, let God call the shots. As I've said in the past, don't play a basketball game picking up your dribble every two steps going, did I foul, did I foul, did I foul? You'll never score a basket. It's no way to play the game. And you can see how the Christian life if played like that, would result in total paralysis. And so he says, if there's some attitude within you that's not of God, guess what? God is, as Donald Trump would say, God is huge, right? <laughs> I'm not advocating for politics here. That was just for fun. <laughs> so God will reveal it to you because God is big and that's his job. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Uh-oh, the third thought in this passage is a standard. I've got to keep living to a standard. And you remember that I said that this passage is kind of like when you're on the internet and you're going through Facebook and one of those pictures pops up. It says, stare at this, stare at this long enough and something will shoot out at you, a 3D image. Well, if you stare at this verse long enough, what shoots out at you is this clear message that we have already attained, past tense. Look at it there carefully. We have already attained, past tense, to a certain standard. So all he is saying is, live like who you are. He's not saying, here's a new standard, good luck, you don't really want it, <laughs> but try to want it, fake it till you make it. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you have already attained a new nature, a new heart, a new spirit, the Holy Spirit within you. A standard of righteousness has been achieved. Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's an incredible standard. Take all of the efforts of the Pharisees, all of the righteousness of the Pharisees, put it in a pile, and Jesus says, your righteousness has to surpass all of that. And then... And then he says, 
you have become the righteousness of God. As a gift, freely, by faith, we become the righteousness of God, and we have attained to an incredible standard because it was a gift. And so now, let us walk like who we are. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk, of whom I often told you and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So he's saying, imitate our faith, not just our behavior. Don't imitate somebody's behavior. That's like the guy, you know, he's got the Walkman on, but there's no sound in it. It's not plugged into anything. You look at the other end of the headphones, and they're not even plugged in, but he's looking over at the guy next to him. And when that guy kicks right, he kicks right. When that guy kicks left, he kicks left. So he's doing this, and it looks so right, right? But it's so very wrong because he's not dancing in step to anything. It's just imitation. But this guy over here, this guy is plugged in. And so what Paul is saying is, don't merely imitate what I'm doing, but as he said in other places, imitate the faith, imitate the dependency, imitate the listening to the Spirit's music. Join in following my example. Observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Many don't do that. They're enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. That means this idea of grace is going to find enemies. This idea that Jesus Christ died and rose again is going to find enemies. He says, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. So what we have here is a group of people who have denied Christ. They've denied the cross. They've denied the resurrection. They are still, as Paul would say, they are still dead in their sins. And as a result of that, what do they they reap? Well, they only reap destruction. They only get what their appetite wants. And so when Paul tells Christians, oh, behave, would you? I mean, when Paul tells Christians in many different ways, when he says, set your mind on things above, when he says, put on love, put on Christ, walk in this way, when he says these things, it's not because it's some sort of law. It's it's because he's saying, look at the people who don't do this. Look at the people whose pattern is the opposite. See where they're getting? Do you see what they reap from that? So how about we skip all that, save some time and energy, and get to know God's way of spiritual health. It's about being healthy, and it's about doing what flows from our heart. For our citizenship is in heaven. That's a pretty cool thought if you think about it. But many Christians, you know, we're not even sure. You would say, well, can I lose my citizenship? Um, You know, maybe it's it's more humble for me to say I've got dual citizenship. (laughs) You know, oh, I'm a sinner and I'm a saint. Right? Both of them together. And so I think this is humility. Sinner and saint. It's kind of a combo. Black dog, white dog, right? But not once. I challenge you to kick the tires on this one. Go back and see what you think, looking at the Word of God. Not once does Paul call Christians sinners. He says to the saints in Rome, to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Corinth. And by the way... The Corinthian performance was pretty ugly looking. The Corinthians, you know, they were, as you know, they were having orgies at the Lord's Supper. They were having inappropriate relations in some cases. And still Paul calls them saints because they are saints not by what they do, but by who they believe in. We are saints by faith, not by works. We are saints by faith, not by performance. And so we do not have a dual citizenship We sometimes act like we do, sure, but we do not have a dual citizenship. You know, decades ago in Canada, uh, the, the government of Canada decided that there were some citizens who had migrated across the border to... Um, you know, open up shop in the United States and work there and live there. And so the, the Canadian government said, you know, we're, we're not going to honor this. We're going to revoke their citizenship because they've migrated to a foreign land. But then, decades later, not too long ago, they changed their minds. The government of Canada decided that they would embrace these citizens and restore their citizenship. And so they drafted hundreds of thousands of letters. 
And when they drafted these letters, they, of course, put them in the mail. And one day, a few days later, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people went to their mailbox that morning, and they, they read the letter. And so that day, they woke up Canadian. They woke up with a new citizenship, which they once had and had lost, but now, because of the decision of the Canadian government, had been restored. Well, you know where I'm going with this. In the Garden of Eden, there was a citizenship that was lost. And through Jesus Christ, there is a citizenship that is regained. And when we open the Word of God, it's like reading that letter. It's like seeing, whoa, my birth certificate. I never knew. In fact, you can imagine there were probably children who grew up in those decades within those families. And maybe some of them, maybe it was possible that some of them didn't even know where they came from or much about their backgrounds. But now, because of this government mandate, because of this government decision, those children could grow up with a birth certificate of sorts, citizenship papers to show them who they really were. And that's what the Word of God is for us. 81% of evangelical Christians think that the Bible is primarily about obeying the rules. And what the Bible is really primarily about is about a citizenship that was lost, a citizenship that is regained, and then telling us who we are and therefore how we can walk. So when we grab a hold of this message and we take one quarter of it and we think this is what the Bible is, telling us what to do, telling us what to do, we've missed the big picture. The big picture is look at what was lost in the garden. Look at the life that is regained in Jesus Christ. You have that life now and therefore we can walk in newness of life. And so he says our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly await our Savior. You can't eagerly await him if you think he's just going to show some old panorama, panoramic movie of your sins, right? Or Panavision. Wasn't that what it was called, the olden days? So imagine all these, all these old movies of your sins. And that's sort of what we grow up with in a religious state. We think, well, God's just going to return and show that movie. Well, we can't eagerly await a God who's going to do that. But the gospel says he destroyed the movie. The gospel says he remembers your sins no more. There is no movie. And then he says, he, give, he gives away Paul's answer. Remember, we were saying, wait a minute, Paul says, I have not attained to it yet. You know, last week we saw Paul say, not that I have become complete yet, but I press on for the prize. And you're like, Paul, what's the prize? What are you pressing on toward? Well, this is what he's pressing on toward. He's pressing on toward that moment that God will transform the body of this humble state, that is our fallen body, He will transform this into conformity with the body of His glory by the exertion of the power that He has even to subject all things to Himself. I don't know what this body is going to look like, but I know that when, G when Jesus had it, you know, for that short time on earth, He kind of demoed it for us. It was like a prototype, you know. He was demoing it. He could walk through walls. He could say goodbye to everybody and float up into the clouds. I mean, some stuff is going to happen. And if you want to look like amazing, I'm sure that can be arranged. I may go for that look myself. I, I understand. But right now, it's just this humble state, right? This humble state that we're in where uh, we got to watch it or else it'll become an even humbler state. So he says that one day we'll get a new body. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Now, I want to just bring to mind here the way that Paul uses the word crown. Because I'll tell you, I think we've misused the word crown in Christianity today. I think that, you know... We, th we imagine that all the great stuff we've done, we're just going to stack these crowns up and it's just going to be amazing how crowned we are in heaven. And you see here that Paul actually says that the Philippian people, that the people of Philippi are his crown and his joy. So, you know, then you say, well, how is that going to fit into our theology of, of the gift shop in heaven? Are we going to be stacking the people up on our heads? 
Of course not. So we've got to allow for the possibility that there is a crown, which is a picture, a symbol of the joy that we have in expressing Christ over a lifetime, and that the crown is Christ, that all things are dung next to knowing Christ, and that what Paul is celebrating here is that these people are a product of his ministry, a product of his investing in the life of Christ, and that they are a joy to him and a crown to him that he will celebrate forever. I urge Euda. Can you say that with me? I looked it up. It's Euda. That's pretty good. Do not name your child this. Okay, great biblical name, but they are totally going to get made fun of. Okay, the next one, and I urge Sintica. Say that with me, Sintica. Yeah, that's a hideous choice as well. These are ladies, and I'm sure they were fine, upstanding ladies, wonderful people, but uh, their names are certainly not for, for our culture. So I urge Udia or Uda and Sintica to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women, you'll notice they're women, help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel. So these women have come alongside this ministry and they have helped Paul through a great struggle. And he says, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers. What does that tell you? That tells you that women were looked at as fellow workers in the gospel. That 2,000 years ago, even though women were devalued in the cultures, the surrounding cultures, that the Bible has always and will always be radical. That when Paul says there is neither male nor female, we are all one in Christ, all the males of his day are going, what? Are you serious? No, no, we've got a higher and a lower status, value and worth, right? And uh, we're not going for this. What are you talking about? He would say, I'm talking about God's view. I'm talking about God's view of man and woman and that it is not our gender that determines our value or our worth. It is the fact that we are in Christ and there is neither male nor female in Christ. The end of Romans reveals that Paul knew of uh, spiritual leaders who were women in Rome as well. I already told you that Lydia was possibly, most likely, the, the source of this Philippian church. Uh, that she was converted, then her whole household was converted, and then next thing you know, there's a group of believers in her city. So, uh, you know, what this tells us is that the gospel is not just radical today. The gospel was culturally radical back then. You know, when Jesus says, let a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, you know, that was pretty radical. That no, 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 we need little Johnny. Okay, we've always known little Johnny. I mean, Johnny cannot leave and go form his own household. He needs to stay with mommy and daddy and we can help him with his wife. And we can all form this nice compound where the, the family grows up together and, and learns what marriage is together. Well, how's that going to work? Huh? Anybody up for that, interested in that? That does not work that well, does it? So Jesus mandates something. He talks about something that was radical in its day. And so it's amazing to see how you could say the Bible is ahead of its time in that sense, right? And then it says their names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Two things I want to point out here. Number one, the Lord is near. That could mean, literally, that the Lord is near you because he's in you. But more likely, my guess, more likely, is that the coming of the Lord is near. The, the apostles thought possibly that Jesus Christ would be back in their lifetime. There's a few clues to that throughout the Bible. Of course, they were wrong about that, right? I mean, we're still waiting on the return of the Lord, and then here come the blood moons, right? So now we know he's really coming back, like last week or something, right? But that didn't work out so well, did it? Maybe he'll come back after the next blood moons. Well, 
the quadruple blood moons theory. It's very popular today in Christian talk radio and Christian teaching. And uh, what you need to know about that is that the quadruple blood moons have happened 62 times in the last 2,000 years. So although it's been taught that this is a unique thing that's just happened, and therefore if I do my algebra with my calculator, then the Lord's coming back next week. Well, many times we've seen that sort of thinking ends up with people who have egg on their face. Because the Bible very clearly says no one knows the day, no one knows the hour, no one even knows the epoch, which means time period. So we're not supposed to pull out Revelation, John's vision, and then pull out our algebra book and try to do some, uh, what do you want to call it? Thank you. <laughs> we don't want to try to be a math magician here and get this going because, you know, it's just not going to work. It says it'll come like a thief in the night and you can't calculate that. So, uh, you know, what I'm saying is, is don't put a lot of stock in people's predictions, people's projections, people's prophecies. Um, because ultimately we need to know that we are in a place of humility and we just don't know what the Lord has. We do know that there is a day, and we do know that there is a time, and we do know that we will have new resurrection bodies. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, talk to Dad. In other words, don't bottle this up. Don't try to be super spiritual and strong. The Bible never tells you to be strong and silent. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. That means that God, look, I'm, I'm feeling pretty weak here. I'm feeling pretty feeble. I don't have answers. This is killing me. This is hurting me. I'm aching. I'm lonely. I'm afraid. I'm this. I'm that. And I'm pouring this out to you. I am letting my requests be made known to you. I'm not pretending to be strong. The idea that there are strong Christians out there is a fantasy. There are no strong Christians. There are only people who are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Paul said he was acquainted with his own weakness. That's our goal. Our goal is to realize our weakness, not to try to put on the air of strength. So, what does that mean, guys? Practical terms, if you feel like your strength is waning, if you feel like your strength is decreasing in the Christian life, if you feel like you just can't seem to go on, if you feel like you just can't seem to make the Christian life work, congratulations, you're in a great spot. I look forward to what God has to do in our lives when we've hit that spot. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I'm going to uh, read through the end of the chapter now. For the sake of time, there's some greetings, some goodbyes. But I don't want you to think that there's no more nuggets in here because there are a few that are pretty amazing. So let me just finish the passage here. Finally, brethren, whatever is true... Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Why? Because dwelling on the other stuff, the ugliness, the sinfulness, the envy, the resentment, the bitterness, where does it get you? You're spinning your wheels. You're not happy. There's a civil war within you. You hate it anyway. So let all that stuff go. Let it go, right? And put on Christ. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul was, you know, his desire was to be at peace with all men. He wasn't trying to be annoying. He wasn't trying to be controversial just to be controversial. His goal was to help people, to help people see truth. And so he's saying, what you've seen in me, you know, be that way in attitude, be that way in faith, and you'll find that God is a God of peace who is with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. I thought you didn't care about me, but now at last you've revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Does that sound like the health wealth gospel? 
Is that the health wealth gospel? I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances. No, the health wealth gospel is wrong. It is an error. It will teach you that if you have enough faith that you can change your circumstances, that God will promise to change all your circumstances. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying he's learned contentment in whatever circumstances he's in. This is the opposite of the prosperity gospel. Watch this. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and, wait for it, wait for it, going hungry? Are you serious? Like God's favorite apostle to the Gentiles had hungry times? Why didn't he just put in enough faith and pull down the handle and out comes the hamburger? You know, if it's health and wealth and promise of prosperity, then why would he say this? In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When I was a kid, I read verse 13. It was all they told me. They said, here's verse 13. This is your American dream with a Bible verse attached to it. You can do whatever you want. Because Christ will do all things through you and you can do all things through him. You could be an astronaut if you want to be. You could be a rocket scientist. You could be a multi-billionaire. I can do all things through Christ. That's not the context. The context is I will survive because I am more than a conqueror through Christ. And whatever circumstance hits me, whether incredible hunger, whether incredible poverty... Whether I am in need or have plenty, Christ is my everything. Do you see the difference? It is not about some American dream with a little Bible verse attached to it. It's not about the promise of prosperity. It's about the promise of having Jesus no matter what circumstance hits. And there are some really bad circumstances that hit Christians Not because God is angry, not because God is punishing. All the punishment was on Jesus, but because planet Earth hurts sometimes. Planet Earth doesn't work out sometimes, does it? Have you found that? There's some disappointment on planet Earth. If we had a formula where everybody could come up and give their lives to Jesus, and then there'd be no disappointment, man, this place would be packed. We'd have 25 services. We'd have people out on the front lawn trying to get in here to figure out how all their circumstances would go away through health and wealth and prosperity. But it's not true. Those promises can only last six months or a year in the revolving door of of churches that teach such things until the smart people figure out that there's only one guy who's getting prosperous here, and it's the pastor. There's only one guy who's getting rich, and it's the guy who says, if you give to me, you'll get back threefold. The threefold never comes. But people are too embarrassed and too ashamed to say, "Uh, uh, Pastor, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, it didn't work for me. Right? Who's going to do that? And so they bank on that. But Paul is teaching that we don't need better circumstances or different circumstances. We need Jesus Christ in every circumstance. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. In other words, yeah, I can get through anything through Christ. But uh, by the way, thanks for the gift. Uh, Needed that. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, thank you. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia... No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek seek for the profit which increases to your account, assuming it's 10%. Is that what it says? Wait a minute, what's going on here? All right, so I'm just really glad that you sent a gift that supported me. You sent it from the heart. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I love you guys. I needed help. I needed support. You guys are my joy. You guys are my crown. And thank you for sending this gift. And also, I believe this gift is going to result in a ton of ministry, a ton of people hearing the gospel. And that's going to be the profit, which increases to your spiritual account, meaning the joy and the contentment and the thank you in your heart that comes from knowing that your gift went towards something incredible. 
But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You did not rob him. No, it doesn't say that. It's not about robbing God. It's about this acceptable sacrifice that God says, Whoa, your financial gift, you smell that? Man, that came from your heart. That came from your heart where Christ lives. Oh, it was 1%. That came from your heart. Oh, it's 13% over there. Oh, it came from your heart. Oh, this week it was 50 bucks. Oh, this week it was $1. It came from your heart, and that's all that matters to me. Right? The lady who gives one coin, what does Jesus say? That gift is a serious, holy, sanctified, set-apart gift Because it came from here. And so it's acceptable. In fact, it's more than acceptable. It's fragrant. And so when people teach that there has to be a certain percentage, guess what happens? Well, we already know what happens. 50% of people sitting in churches across America give nothing. Okay? The other 50% give an average of 3%. So the 10% teaching is not working anyway. So why not just tell the truth and let the chips fall where they may and let people give from the heart if they want to give? And then we'll see people saying, oh, my gift matters. My gift actually matters if it's from the heart, even if it's 1% or 0.5% or 4%. Even if it's 11, there's no percentage. It's about the heart. That's what makes it acceptable and fragrant and well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches where? Not his riches out here, his riches in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that... The grace giving is the exact same as the grace living. They're not two different beliefs. They're not two different doctrines. We don't teach grace and then pressure people. We teach grace from start to finish. Father, we thank you that we can give from the heart and that you say it's it's a pleasing, fragrant aroma, an awesome sacrifice of our finances. If it's from the heart, that's all that matters. Father, we thank you that... We can do all things through Christ, and that doesn't mean hollow promises. It means that in the difficulties that planet Earth throws our way, that Jesus Christ is our everything. He's the only thing that matters. He's the only thing that lasts. He's the only thing that is unbreakable, unshakable, and untakeable. No one can take him from us. Father, we thank you for this message of identity in Christ, that we have a new citizenship restored to us, that we, a people, are citizens of heaven. This will never be revoked. The gifts and the calling, you say, are irrevocable. They'll never be taken. Father, we thank you for this security. We thank you for the joy that wells up within us as a result. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing, and mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a Savior, the home of nation. can move the mountains my God is mighty to say he is mighty to say forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave in this series 
we saw a man who went from a place of jail to a place of joy. And maybe you haven't spent any time in jail, but spiritually we have been in a place of bondage, locked, locked up, the Bible says, until faith came. And so we were locked up by a legalistic religious bondage of trying our best or just living under sin and feeling bad about it. We were locked up. And then through the gospel, we get this opportunity to go from jail to joy. How does God do that? Not by telling us to put on a mask where we fake it till we make it, but instead by rigging it so that joy becomes a natural byproduct. How does joy spring from this? Well, when you got a God who says, hey, look, I don't need you to examine you. I don't need you to self-inspect. I don't need you to be your own fruit inspector here. I've taken all your sins away. I've made you into my righteousness. I've put my life in you forever. It'll never be taken so that you can take your eyes off of you and stop worrying about you and enjoy me. And that's where the joy comes from. The joy, the real joy, the lasting joy, it's not a smile, it's not an emotion, it's a knowing. At the deepest level, it is a knowing of what our Jesus Christ has done for us and that it can never be thwarted, it can never be reversed, it can never be taken away. That's what we celebrate and that's what results in genuine joy. Have a great day.